Hello and welcome to COP4708 Applied Database 1. I'm Dr. Ron England, your guide and sponsor and professor. This is Module 3, Lecture 4, Normalization. We've talked about functional dependencies. And we've talked about keys. So far we've talked about primary keys and we've talked about foreign keys. Okay. Now we're going to take all those concepts and I'm going to use the term foreign key and prim uh, primary key and foreign key. I'm going to talk about determinants, um, which of course are great candidates for primary keys. But a primary key does specifically mean a key in a table that is the determinant for the actual rest of the entity, uh, the rest of the fields in the table. Why? Why do we do normalization? Well, here's something that can occur in databases. We have anomalies. When a database is not done well, you end up with three types of anomalies, insertion, deletion, and update anomalies. And what this means is when you insert some data, okay, you need other data to insert it into the table. Sometimes that data isn't even completely related to it. In a previous example, we had a, data, we had a table that included the student in the course table. So in other words, you couldn't insert a course unless you already had a student enrolled in the course. That's not a good design. We're going to have to fix that one. Okay, you have deletion anomalies. In other words, in, a, in that table, if you deleted the last student, you also deleted the course. The course no longer exists if you delete that row. The student goes, boom, the whole thing goes. That's a bad design. Okay. And update anomalies. Suppose you have, like in this table right here, you've got, um, this, is, this is the repair table that we're going to fix. Hmm. Suppose we want to change the acquisition cost, acquisition cost of the drill press. Well, the drill, drill press is in there two times. Every time the drill press get re, gets repaired, the cost of acquiring it needs to be added to the table and if it changes in one place, it's got to change everywhere. Otherwise, you've got multiple values for it. Bad, 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 bad design. Let's fix it. So what is the process called? We call it normalization. Normalization. Now, how do we do this? Okay. We talked about functional dependencies. You identify them. You go to that table and you identify the functional dependencies. Then you identify the candidate keys. Now, if there's a functional dependency, okay, that has a determinant that is not a candidate key, okay, essentially what you're going to do is you're going to move it to its own table. So you take the columns of that functional dependency and you put them into a new table, okay? You make the determinant of that new that whole thing the primary key of the new table. And you'll leave a copy of that determinant as a foreign key in the original table. And you make a, you make a constraint between them. You have a foreign key dependency between the two with a referential integrity constraint. And you just do it over and over again. Okay, so as you split the table up into two tables, that's it. That's simple. Okay. What are the key parts of this? Well, first identifying the functional dependencies and then identifying the candidate keys. Okay, so we're going to organize it. You're going to get rid of redundancy. You're going to get it rid of dependencies. And it's going to really always going to take big tables and make them into smaller tables. Now realize that when you take one big table and make it into multiple smaller tables, you're going to complicate the process of making queries because now you've got to join the tables back if you need the data for all of this stuff. But you get rid of the anomalies. Okay, you don't need... It basically makes the data make more sense. Okay. And when you say avoiding bias for any particular pattern of querying, the queries can now be structured in such a way that you join the tables that give you the data that you need to have. That's really what it boils down to. Sometimes that does require a rejoin, but that's okay. There are multiple levels of normal forms. We go from 1NF, 2NF, 3NF, there's 4NF, 5NF, and 6NF. Okay, BCNF, which is very commonly the one that is called, we call it BCNF. And that's every, um, 
it's a table in which every determinant is a candidate key. Okay, that's pretty much, you know, that's pretty straightforward. Um, the rules of the other ones are can get restrictive. Y and F is not restrictive at all. Okay. A table, a table that qualifies as a relation is in Y and F. In other words, if you got a table that's a table, it's in Y and F. Okay. If all of the non-key attributes are dependent upon the primary key, you're in 2 and F. In other words, everything that's in there is functionally dependent upon that primary key. Doesn't mean that there might not be some internal relations that um, have dependencies, but at least it goes back to a dependency onto the primary key. All right, we're gonna move forward because we're gonna start looking at this by examples. Let's look at that equipment repair. Hmm. Why would the item, I and mean, we got item number and we got the item information in the repair database because it really is a repair database. We need to get that item information somewhere else because look at this. The equipment type and the acquisition cost are dependent upon the item number. In other words, item number is a determinant to equipment type and acquisition cost. Repair number, well, what, do we, what, what really goes with repair number? We have a date and a cost. That obviously makes sense. A repair number would be, so, so repair number does look like it's a good determinant for those two. And in the repair, you do need to know the equipment, piece of equipment that it was being repaired. So you probably want that item number. Well, how does this look when you put this all together? How do these, how do these, how do these dependencies work? Well, item number, okay, type and acquisition cost, okay. It is a determinant of type and acquisition cost. It isn't a determinant of the repair or anything to do with the repair. Repair number, okay, so in that repair, the repair number is a candidate key to a repair. What does a repair need to know? It needs to know what item was repaired. Okay, it needs to know the cost, the date, the amount. It might need to know the type of repair. We had type of repair in there. So, if we normalize this, the process of identifying the determinants and what they determine, item number determines type and acquisition cost. Okay, the repair number determines the repair date and the repair amount, but it also needs to have the item number, which is now going to be a foreign key to the item. That's not too bad. That's, that's not bad at all. So what does this look like when we're done? This makes much more sense. There's your items, okay, item number being a primary key for the equipment, okay, type and acquisition cost, those make perfect sense to go with that. The repair number, the repair knows its item number, okay, what was being repaired, repair date, repair cost. Oh, not so bad. I think this is a pretty good design here. We've, we've done pretty good. Now. Could there be other things that we needed to do to this? Well, with what we started with at one table, this looks like a very good design. Might be more complex because, well, it isn't that complex of a table that we started with. There could, we, we can definitely, you, you might be starting with something more complex. In many cases, you will. That skew data, hmm, this is one and F. I mean, everything kind of goes, it's, it's a table. Um, well, if you look at this, the skew, okay, the skew number seems to be, in this case, is got the, the description. But if you look at the department and the buyer, hmm, now we've got some decisions here. Because the SKU does say, I mean, it, it is for the SKU 100-100, it is in the Department of Water Sports, but look at the buyer in the department. The buyers are each in a single department. Pete Hansen in Water Sports, Nancy Myers in Water Sports, Cindy Lowe in Camping, and Jerry Martin in Climbing. So, hmm, it appears that there's a relationship between the department and the buyer. So how do we put this together here? Well, we can say that the SKU is a determinant for the SKU description department and buyer. 
But the skew descriptions are unique also. So the skew description is also a determinant for the skew, uh, the SKU in the department of the buyer. Hmm. So we've got some candidate keys, SKU and SKU description, but which one would make more sense? Well, I'm kind of going to go with the smaller one. The SKU makes more sense to have as your candidate key. So let's say SKU has now got SKU description, department, and buyer. But buyer and department has a relationship too. We can see that. So do we really need to have both department and buyer in the, the table that deals with the SKU, with the items? No, we really don't. We can put those into a separate, we can put those into a separate table. So we can reduce this down a little bit more. So if we say that SKU is SKU description, department, and buyer, but let's say we take the buyer determines the department. We know that, that if you know the buyer, you do know the department. So now we could just say it's um, going to be SKU, description, and buyer. Hmm. So let's say, what can we do with that? SKU, description, and buyer, and now buyer has a specific department. We've reduced it down into two tables. And so here's your new sets of relationships with that, based on what we had started with originally. Now, does this make logical sense? Well, you really need to know the organization of how this stuff is put together to know if it makes logical sense. But the reality is, with the table that we had, it makes perfect sense the way that we've redesigned it. Okay, so, yeah, not too bad. Multi-value dependencies. Okay, now, this can get pretty complex. Okay, now, let's take an example of employees of a company and degrees. An employee can have multiple degrees. We've now got a multiple value dependency. And a degree obviously can have multiple people that have it. Hmm. Part kits can have multiple parts. So these types of dependencies kind of give us a little bit of trouble. Let's look up in table form. Well, in the case of Chow and, and his BS degree, there's only one Chow, one BS degree. doesn't look like a problem. But with Green, who's got three degrees, a BS, an MS, and a PhD. So now we've got two people with a BS degree, Chow and Green, and Green has got three degrees. Oh, we got to deal with that. we got to be able to do some designs for that. Um, same situation with employee and sibling, and same situation with part kits and parts. You've got... Um, Parts that can appear, appear in multiple kits, and you got kits that can have multiple parts. And you got employees that can have siblings, and siblings that can have other, you know. Okay. <laughs> what do we do? Well, what if we just take them all and put them into separate relationships? We're not going to deal with those just yet. But we're going to go as far to say we can put them into their own table. Okay, we can call it a relation table or a multiple relation table. We can come up with names for it, but right now, let's just say we've got a way to put them into their own relation or their own table. So now we've got different levels of forms here. Hmm. So if we've got situations with functional dependencies that we need to fix, 1NF, 2NF, 3NF, and BCNF are ways to look at how we deal with functional dependencies. Okay, what's a good one if you're dealing with, you know, just dealing with the anomaly of functional dependencies? Well, BCNF is a pretty good one. Okay, just a set of rules that say this works pretty well. Does it mean that you're always going to go BCNF? Absolutely not, but it's a good one to work with. Now, if you've got multi-value dependencies, which we didn't have in that previous example, at least we didn't know that we had any. There could have been some there. We didn't identify, but we didn't see them. And now we can go to foreign F, which says, hey, let's move all these multi-value dependencies into their own table. And we're going to talk about how we do that, how we deal with many-to-many -many relationships later. There's a way to deal with those in our table structure. Now we've got specific constraints 
and I'm going to use, I hate using the term oddities, but oddities would be the same thing being used in, let's say, multiple domains would be an oddity. And we have ways of dealing with that one. DKNF, which is one of the ones that um, we deal with, um, it's another level of normalization that's even higher than the ones that we've looked at. So the database has no constraints other than keys and domain constraints in a, in a DKNF. It's a high level of normalization. And there's even one higher than that, 6NF. We're not going to talk about that one just yet. And one of the things about the normalization process is that you almost every time you do a normalization, you add to the number of tables. And when you add to the number of tables, you add to the number of joins necessary to do a query. And you make your queries complex. So your level of normalization is really dependent upon not just wanting to reach a specific level of normalization. It's also dependent upon how you plan on using the database in the end anyway. Because potentially you may have anomalies that you don't care about because they'll never actually occur in the way that you use the database. Okay, that's a definite possibility. What you do want to do is know the process of normalization and get a good idea of identifying that this is a good or a bad level. I mean, you should, it, it, database design has a little bit of an element of art to it. That reason for art is because databases are used in different ways. So you've now seen normalization. You've seen constraints and functional dependencies and how to put it all together. Now we get to start pretty soon with the fun part, which is actually taking real data and designing. On out.